Okay, That's Albert. where I belong. Um, why don't you uh, tell me the story of how you and Frida came to meet? That's, that's very interesting. Uh, I was in Flint, Michigan um, in practice in surgery and I was getting ready to leave there. I was, um, I was, had some uh, friendly conflict with the guy I worked with. I didn't want to take over his practice because we were partners. So I decided I would leave. And I was planning on leaving that year. And then in July, Frida came there as an intern. It was interesting that when I first saw her, uh, everybody knew who she was. I mean, that she was an intern, she was, she was a Jewish girl, and here I was a Jewish bachelor, uh, bachelor at the uh, hospital. And I remember the first time that she was down in the dining room at, at a table, and I came down to the dining room, and everybody was watching me see how I would react. Why, were you the only Jewish doctor on staff? Or was a bachelor? No, I was the only, single. that's right, the and single the right person. <laughs> at the single person. And uh, I did a double look at her, a double take, and uh, uh, I think shortly after that I asked her out. Well, can you tell me what she looked like? When, like, what did she look like? Uh, she, she looked very, she was very pretty. She was heavier than she is now. I think I she, she remember she told me she was 135 at that time. I wasn't that heavy. Well, it was you were heavy. 128 maybe. Okay, all right. But uh, when I this down to the wedding. This the 122. Yeah, this right. that didn't bother me. Anyway, I asked her out uh, in a few days, and uh, and uh, I liked her. I don't know much how much she liked me, but after six weeks there, we got married. We, and I think in four weeks' time, I asked her to marry me. Because then two weeks later, two weeks from from that time on, I had my secretary call everybody to make uh, arrangements for the wedding. No, no announcement were made. Was sent out. She That's just fun. called. What did you like about her? Well, she was very pretty, and very smart. I could see that, and I that was one of the, the reasons why I did marry her. She was a smart girl. Was she like she is now? Opinionated? No, that she developed later. <laughs> she wasn't opinionated in those days? At least, uh, I don't think so. Was she insecure about being the only woman or, or, or a minority on staff? No, not at all. But one, there were a couple of interesting facts about that. She got there, I remember, from school, and she had a, a ratty camel hair coat. And, I, cool. and we went out to parties, and I couldn't get her to get rid of it and get a different coat. She always wanted to wear that. I guess there was like a, a, um, a, a comforter or something for her. And uh, finally, she, she changed it and, and got rid of it. Yeah. Also, one time we were at a party, and I thought, what kind of a girl am I, am I married to? We were at a party one time, and there was a girl there who was sick and vomiting all the time. And she volunteered to take her home in my car. <laughs> so I figured this is crazy. Anyway, that's Frida. She always to help the underdog, and she did all the time. Was she a clothes horse in those days? A clothes what? A clothes horse. Did she like clothes? No, no. I don't think so. She was not at all like that. Was she a redhead? At all times. Sometimes red. And later on, blonde or whatever. But I think red was her, her favorite color. Uh, she, she became pregnant during the, her, uh, during the internship. And at times, uh, she worked and, and I came over and stayed with her at the hospital and uh, to keep her company. And sometimes when she didn't feel well, she hired one of the other residents to take her shift <laughs> and work that way. Uh, the end, I did that. Yeah, it's... Uh, if you have money, you can hire somebody to do your work. <laughs> <laughs> it's, she did very well. In fact, uh, she was the first inter female intern we took at the hospital, and uh, the guy I worked with had to make a special quarters for her over our office. We had an office right next door to the hospital, and he built uh, an apartment for her upstairs. Which I stayed in like six yeah. weeks, and we rented an apartment together. Yeah. And uh, she did very well. She was a good intern. Uh, they, all, they all liked her. She was smart, which I saw that right away not only smart as a doctor, but as an individual. 
Did um, did she make a lot of waves? Not at that time. No. No, I, th I think she was just learning that she could make waves, but she didn't do it at that time. She was uh, pretty good, but she was. Uh, if I can recall, she controlled the other interns. She uh, told them what to do, and she she ran it in a way. She supervised them. She was smart, manager, managerial, and as a physician. Uh, when she uh, when she finished her internship, we decided to go. We didn't know where we were going to practice, so we went out to California. We looked there. I didn't see any opportunities there. Uh, we looked at, we, I don't know if we went down to Florida, but I knew there weren't any opportunities there, and so we went back to New York. We went to Philadelphia first, because I knew somebody in Philadelphia, and uh, he had a choice of taking me or somebody that he knew already in practice. But uh, he took the other person because he knew him. So anyway, I came to New York, and I knew a lot of people in New York uh, who had interned at the hospital out in Flint, Michigan. So I got started here, and in fact, I was the first osteopathic surgeon in the state of New York, certified osteopathic surgeon. And I got on the staff of uh, about a half a dozen private hospitals, and I was got practice and started within. We lived in a um, we lived in a uh, in a, a room, uh, in a small apartment in Howard Beach, and after three years, we. Uh, we built this home where we are now, and uh, Frida supervised that. She used to come over here almost every day while they were building it and uh, was supervising them, and uh, that was it. One interesting thing is that uh, when we moved into New York, we only had one car, and I would take Frida whenever she had to. <laughs> so she got upset and said, I got to have my own car, and so we got out and we bought another car, which I thought was a little... Uh, unusual uh, for uh, to have a two-car uh, family, uh, as much as I knew about it. And anyway, uh, we got a car and she was happy for that. Now you, then you had 11, 11 cars, cars later. Yeah. <laughs> you thought two was unusual. <laughs> At the, what else happened in, in New York? Oh, and she, was, um, she did a little practice in, um, worked for another doctor's office. She had her children, and even while she was children, she worked. And then she got interested in um, the emergency room, and she stayed in the emergency room, and that was where she be that was her strength. And she did very well in that. And she went from, she taught herself, and, and without going to a residency, she became a specialist in that by taking courses. Every time there was a course that was for in medicine and surgery, cardiology, pediatrics, or whatever pertaining to emergency, she was in it. And the found she got to the point now where she goes to these courses, it, it's not much that she can get out of it because she already knows it all. She is, when she's good, she's very good. When she's bad, she's horrible. <laughs> I think that's a quote. She, she's a perfectionist, and that's it. And she's intolerant to stupidity and ignorance, which is um, good in some ways, but it's uh, tough for others. She sometimes doesn't have the dipl diplomacy to um, uh, correct some people. She's, because she feels very strong in what she does and or says. And, um, uh, but after it's over with, it, she's a new person again, and people see that. And they, they look at her as a guru, as a, uh, and, and they love her. At times they, they feel upset about her, but she wins them over. She's, she's great that way. My father's like that. Yeah. Um, what about, tell me about your trips to, to all these exotic places. Was that Frida's doing too? Uh, yes. Um, did you enjoy those family trips? Yes, I did. I, you people sometimes go on trips and leave the kids home. But when we go on a trip, we, the kids were always with us. In fact, once we had, I think it was Terry, which was still a baby in arms, we would take her. And we go to a place down like from Florida where we'd get a babysitter and uh, they would take care of them. We went to overseas. We went to 
to um, South America, to the jungle, uh, to, um, to, of course, to England and France and uh, Greece. Uh, at, to what? And, and, and Italy and uh, Africa. Uh, and, Africa and the kids enjoyed it and I enjoyed it also. And finally, as the kids got older, they became too boring. They didn't want to go with us. We couldn't get them to come with us anymore. We had trouble getting kids to go with us. Now they want to stay home with their own uh, friends. So you never, went on, you never went on a vacation without your kids? No. We always went on vacation during the, their, their holidays, during the Christmas, New Year's, which was always usually about a 10 or 12 day period. And we always made arrangements that way. And when I was in practice here in New York, I was partners with somebody, and that was my holiday time. And uh, we always took that time. It wasn't much of a restful holiday, though, was it? Uh, well, I don't know it was restful for me. I don't know it was for, for Frida, but for yeah, me it was. sleeping, and I'd be sitting there with the maps all over the place, <laughs> mapping out the she, next yeah. day. She planned, the, she planned a trip. In fact, when we went to Africa, she planned the whole trip. We, we, we rented a, a um, van. Volkswagen van and uh, and it was with a, it was a stick shift and I didn't learn how to use that and I think I killed the, the the gears on that and we had to wait a couple of days until they fixed it before we got home. Sold the mountains. <laughs> you were right. driving yourselves around Africa? Yeah, right. all around. Yes. No, this was Morocco. Morocco. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was unbelievable. We were here on a mountain road and he strips the gears. It, uh, uh, we just didn't use the right gear so you just wore it out. So, so we, we no, no, a truck comes up, you know, and he stops, he tries to help us. Another car comes up and they try to help us. Yeah. And they finally got started enough and they accompanied us into the next town. So here we went to the next town, one car in front of us, one behind us, to make sure we got to the next yes. town in the gas station. It was, we got stuck in a town, they had a swimming pool, so the kids didn't mind that they were swimming and it took a day or so to fix the car and that's it. It was a rented car, so a it was van, no problem, a van. a van. It was no problem that way at all. Uh, the, all the trips we went to were great, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, it was Frida's uh, management. Uh, we went to China, and they uh, made a special tour uh, for uh, us. No, I, I, I have to tell you that one, one, the they, one they called us, they, no, named, to, they yeah. named us the, the, the Heyman 7. That was the H-E-Y-7. 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 It was the name of our tour. I have to tell you, you know, there's some very funny stories, but this one was... Uh, we, uh, we had so go sit next we're, time. We're in China. <laughs> come and over here. China had just. I don't come over. To go in. China just opened to American tourists. All well, right. see if they can't get you on camera. Go sit I don't next to Albert. I'm smoking. Any doesn't it's, matter. China had just opened to American tourism. Yeah. We were one of the first groups in. They're called the Hey Seven. Every, every place in the reservation read H E Y Seven, because everything there is eight. Everything is tables of eight, and. Um, we had a tour guide that Lori stayed friends with for years, a young college student, he was in his twenties, about the same age as Lori. He was like six foot two. We said, he said, what do you do? He said, the state told me how to play basketball because I was so tall. You know, he's fluent in English. And he loved, he and the kids disappeared. I mean, they loved each other. And he said, he says, I never get any young Americans. The first time I've ever had young, well, I get it, these old ladies. Lori was teaching him Yiddish, <laughs> the, all the wrong words. She was saying, the next time you get a busload of senior citizens say, okay, Yentas, time to get out. I said, Lori, don't do that to him. You know, he didn't know what these words meant. So anyhow, suddenly we get what happens. An invitation comes to us. We're in one of the hotels. An invitation comes. The Minister of Tourism would like to have dinner with us. He would like to invite us to dinner because he wants to meet a typical American family. So I said, okay, you know. Well, fine, you know, no problem. We, of course, had no clothes. You know, we were not dressed for the dinner. I think I, I had one blazer or something. I, I throw it out. I threw it on or whatever. And um, they said, you know, we'll pick you up at whatever time. And I remember, the next thing I know, we're in this, this official, whatever it is, all these officials come. We're escorted to this official dining room wait a minute, with this big round table. Wait a minute. With and a lazy Susan in the middle. With, with, with these, these dignitaries, and this, the, the Minister of Tourism comes in with his translators, and each, each chair has a waiter behind it. I thought the kids were, and I kept kicking the kids, keep your mouth shut, <laughs> keep your mouth shut, don't open your face. I could not believe, I thought it was going to be a little casual dinner. I could not believe this, like, like a steak dinner. 
Was it good? Well, I don't even remember, but anyhow, I just kept saying, do what he does, do whatever he does. <laughs> you know, sitting there like that, do what he does, you know, watch him. And he had his translator, and um, I sat next to him, and, you know, everything he did, I did, and he put up the drinks to toast, you know, we put up the drinks to toast. I thought I was going to squirt a gut. And he's asking about life in America, and um, the kids, I can see, are... are killing themselves, trying to keep a straight face. This was an official steak dinner. Wow. He didn't stay through the whole dinner, he stayed about halfway. And then he, you know, excused himself and he left with his, you know, entourage and, you know, he said, you know, enjoy your dinner, enjoy your stay. And I thought I was going to die. I'll, I'll never forget that when I realized, I thought it was just going to be a nice little dinner. It was a yeah. state dinner. Yeah. A province dinner. I mean, a waiter behind each one of us, and a whole nine yards, and the translators, and the, the dignitaries, and the cameras. I said, oh, yeah. shit. We were one of the first uh, visitors to China when it opened right. up and for tourism. Quote, unquote, no, it was very, you know, and, you know, just general small talk, but he wanted a typical, quote, unquote, American family. That's, that's what, how the invitation went. I mean, some really, uh, telling the story of, uh, I, I don't know, are these stories boring? No. Uh, the, the other interesting story was uh, when we were in Africa, and this was with Lori and Terry. So we were, um, we were going to one of the game reserves, and I think, yeah, we had trouble with our, our car, our van. Um, but what they have, they had the little Suzuki vans, and they actually have detachable parts. I mean, it's unbelievable. The whole game park has these. You lift up the hood, you pop out your part, you pop in the new one. So um, we were stranded, I forget what burned down, and so we were sitting on the side of the road, it was one of the little uh, game station, uh, uh, guard, guard, you know, guard stations, you know, a little hut or something. We are sitting there, all lined up on the curb, you know, waiting for our driver to fix the van. It was just a matter of popping out a piece, he goes in the back, he has a whole stock of pieces and comes down and pops it back. In the meantime, this other van, everything is van there, you know, and he goes through the... Uh, the junk, you know, to the game preserves, the, everything is a van. You know, on the top, you shoot off, you, the roof comes up, you shoot off the top. And this van goes by, who stopped, I would ever get the rest of the van, and four of the most gorgeous young guys pile out. And from Sweden. From Sweden, these blondes, six foot four blondes, with these little teensy shorts with the tuchuses hanging out. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> these, these four gods pile out of this van. And, you know, so Lori starts talking to him, and they said, oh, you know, if you want, we'll, we'll take her ahead, you know, because we're going to this. And anyhow, she decided not to, and that was it. We said, nah, you know, I was a little uneasy. I said, let her stay with us. They said, you know, we'll take her ahead with us. So sure enough, we get to the hotel, and the hotels there are all open. Your rooms are closed, but all the main areas are open, because that's what people pay for. They pay there to sit at the bar and watch the elephants, you know, 50 feet away. So... Um, we, uh, you know, we don't hang out at the bars, but it was all full of young people, the bar there, these open bars. So Lori and Terry hang out, and lo and behold, who they meet, they meet these four guys. And they found out these four guys are from Sweden, they just camped out. They weren't even staying though, they were camping out. But they were, you know, they hung out at the, the bar there, like they do in the United States. And um, so I said, okay, you know, have a good time. And we're going to the room, your father and I, you know, we're going back to the room. We're not going to hang out, you know, at the bar all night. Um, and the bars there, the hangouts are the same as they are here in any other place. Um, we went back and we had in that day, we had adjoining rooms, but it was one door and then you went into this one door and went one way for their room. And so we have twin beds and this is a lodge and I'm sitting there reading in my twin bed and your father's reading in the other twin bed and suddenly Lori knocks at the door. Could they please use our shower? <laughs> but they're, you know, they're out camping and could they pl please use our shower? <laughs> So I said, okay, we hear these four guys pile in with it, use the shower. Um, and then after that, Lori says, so-and-so, Sven has a sore throat, could you please look at his sore throat? I said, okay. <laughs> but here, I'm sitting reading my book and I'm looking at these four guys, you know, piling through, you know. You know, looking, you know, it was unbelievable. And so they had a good time. You know, there's a chance to get a good hot shower in a hotel instead of, Camping out of them, God knows what. Uh, that tents. Was, that would be on the tent or wherever, however they camped out. A lot of people camped out in Africa, but it was funny. So we, we had some uh, interesting adventures. Yeah, that was a time. That was one of the last times I think we went on a, a, a far trip. Or, or the Indian trip where you had diarrhea. Oh, yes. 
That was a I forgot that one. Where we uh, had a long stretch where again our van it was a long stretch. You know, there's a lot of little short short hop jets in India, you know, from city to city. They have these short range jets that take, you know, you know, like an hour in the air. But for whatever reason this last leg of the trip there was no short range jets. So we had a van, you know, we hired we had a van, a driver and a tour guide that drove us. And it was a good long trip. It was yeah. what, about six well, hours I think. And we did it at night. And well, Robert had diarrhea. Uh, let me tell you this. The, <laughs> I, whenever I go on a uh, for overseas, a very sensitive uh, intestinal tract, I, I get diarrhea. He has diarrhea on the plane. And this, I mean, he's not even hasn't landed yet in the foreign country, nor he has diarrhea. And this time, I, I got, I, I, had to, I told the driver I had to stop. And it was, a, it was dusk. It wasn't really dark. It was dusk. And I had to run off to the. Wait, to I, mean, the we had, we, I don't know how he motioned to the driver, and I had a pile of. Um, Big thick uh, napkins that I take from the last hotel because I knew he was having problems. So we were traveling this high stack of you know yeah. these big well, anyway, I ran off, napkins. Yeah. I ran off into the uh, weeds, a little bit of bush, with a little bit, and uh, I I had to do what I had to do. And while I'm doing it, a woman walks by leading a goat, <laughs> nonchalantly, didn't mean anything, and that was it. Another time. Well, when he came. Out, we're being led with the driver is laughing at everybody. I mean, can you imagine him crouched in the weeds, you know, <laughs> shitting his lungs, you know, his butt out. This woman walks by with this big And another time, we were at the uh, Taj Mahal, and I said, I'm having trouble again. And I said, I don't think I can wait till I get back to the hotel. And I held as long as I could, and I couldn't. And they told me where the, the restroom was, and I practically ran to it. And when I was there, on the way there, there were women uh, we, attendants, we, we, and they we, knew we, what was there. happening. <laughs> so they got in there. As he goes running in. And uh, there's no t toilet papers at all. <laughs> I had to use my handkerchief and got rid of it, and oh. that was it. <laughs> That's the worst part about traveling. Yeah. W weren't the, weren't the, didn't the attendants give you for, for a tip? They gave you the toilet paper? They didn't have any, no, not there. I didn't, they didn't have any well, what paper. What they do, they don't have any toilet paper because the attendant then gives it to you and tip them. <laughs> well, if there was, I didn't know about it. And, um, but I said, I always had trouble that way, especially, especially in India. Uh, Nobody else had one, one second of trouble. Yeah, he always, I mean, we, ate sh we didn't even know we were eating half the time, but he, <laughs> I said, the plane hasn't landed yet and he's already having problems. <laughs> I had one so time. You can't say it's the food. At one time, I don't remember what country it was. I had an attack. We were stopped off in a restaurant, and everybody was upstairs. And I had to go downstairs to the men's room, and I sat there a long time. And I think you sent one of the kids down. <laughs> and that I was, was when you were. <laughs> I was having so much cramping. I was groaning with, with pain. We were all upstairs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there's. And you know, he said he has to go to the bathroom. I think 20 minutes, 25 minutes go by. <laughs> he doesn't come back. So I said, Lori, go find your father. I think it was Lori. I said, Lori, why is the men's room? She comes back. She says, Mom, she said, I heard terrible noises coming out of the men's room. I was having terrible cramps. <laughs> I said, Yeah, it was probably your father. <laughs> uh, we had a good time. So. Yeah, she says, I heard these. Terrible growth we, uh, noises. Yeah. You know? We uh, we saved up for a whole year, and every year we spent I think ten to fifteen thousand dollars just for the yeah, trip. Yeah, I spent up to twenty. I spent twenty on the African. Yeah, That's just crazy. for for the, all the kids, oh, the, the airfare and, and everything. Yeah. Yeah, close to twenty. Well, to take, you know, we used to go with seven people, and then it was it was you know it was you know it was um, uh, you know twenty five hundred a person. You know, sure, 2500 is cheap for two people, but try going seven. But <laughs> without spending money, I was already up to two, you know, $20,000. And when we went to uh, China, we stopped off at Los Angeles for a day San or two Francisco at the... Was it San Francisco? Mm -hmm. No, we went to Disneyland. No, that was when we went to... Um, Hawaii. Hawaii, that's right. And, uh, and we stopped off on the... Uh, make the trip, no, break the trip up. Take a long trip. And... Uh, we had uh, we good we had good times. Yeah, Hong Kong was water wall shopping. Yeah, water wall it was shopping. it was great. Yeah. Uh, every place we went. I, 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 one more story. When we were in uh, China again, my first people, you know, early tourists into China. So we stopped and we spent three days in Hong Kong, which was great. Water wall shopping, seven a.m. to seven p. 
I mean, they had to leave me out of the malls, you know, my, my eyes were glassy. I mean, literally, they had, it was like this, and I finished. Um, I've never seen shopping like this in my life. I mean, they make it very easy for you to shop. Every store in the world is there. I mean, you can go to the malls, and they make the malls lounge areas. They want you to stay in the malls. They've done everything possible to keep you in there. Restaurant, lounges, sleeping areas. <laughs> so you stop at store one, you order a suit, and say, you come back in an hour, you come back in an hour and get your suit. And we ordered glasses, you come back in an hour and get your glasses. You know, whatever you want, you just, they, they'll do it right there for you. You know, it's not come back next week. <laughs> so our flight to Pijing, which is Peking, left at night. It was a night flight. And um, we, we get on this plane, we're on the to Pijing in the morning. And we get on this flight, and I guess, I forget what, Air China or something. And it was, very, it was a very Spartan airline. And all of a sudden, it, it lands. And I look out, I don't see a light anywhere. I don't see anything. It's pitch black. Was that China or was that Russia? No, that was Russia. No, that was China. Pitch <coughs> black. And everybody starts piling off the plane. You know, they start getting up and going off the plane. And I kept saying, Pijing, Pijing, and nobody's you know, paying much attention to me. I said, oh, we landed at Pijing. Everybody's getting off the plane. And finally, the last one's off the plane. They motioned to us to come off. And what it was, believe it or not, is you then went into a little shack, and that was their customs going into China, because you always go through customs the first time you set foot in a foreign country. And here we are, Hay 7, you know, everything is Hay 7, and what it was, it was a food stop. And then you walked in, and the entire dining room was set up with tables for, for your dinner break. <laughs> and we were the last ones, by the time we got in, you know, the first groups had already finished, and everybody's lounging around, smoking cigarettes, drinking tea, and that was your food, because they didn't serve food on the plane. Wow. And then everybody finished their, their dinner break, you know, magnificent food, everything's family style there. I said, we were actually got the last table, the first table, you know, we got there, knew it was a food stop, rushed off the plane, got right in and ate. And then we got back on the plane, and then whatever, another couple, and then we landed in Beijing. Oh, no shit, in the middle yeah. of nowhere, <coughs> they stopped for the dinner. And talking about a plane, when we made our trip oh, to uh, oh, South okay. Africa, and rather to South America, we had to uh, go from the, uh, the good city to the, <coughs> to the inner yeah, part of it. Yeah. We were on a small plane, and uh, there was crates there of food. There was, I think, chickens in there. Yeah. And people were sitting on, and on the, the crates. And the seats were not across. There were benches on the side. There was the cracks. Were actually, right, there were cracks. They had yeah. stuff in newspapers. You know, through the cracks of the plane, because it's a little hot plane, you know, it flies a few thousand feet and then it lands on a grass field and, you know, picks up a town and then it goes again, you know, whatever, 100 miles and it lands on another grass field. And your legs were up and all the, uh, you know, all the produce and the shit and, the, and it was unbelievable. So fuel, they, you had to get up from your seat, the guy climbed out over the wing, poured fuel in, came back in. Um, and I, I'll never forget, I'm looking up on the top of this, you know, all the produce and the chicken, and up top is... A young couple necking, you know, right up, up on top, you know, I'm watching them on top of all this produce. And, you know, it was very funny because um, the pilot came out, he looked like something that belonged on a poster. I mean, if you ever wanted to visualize a South American pilot. He an an a American pilot. pilot. Well, no, South uh. American, tall, dark, handsome, you know, the black hair, the shiny white teeth. I mean, he belonged on a post. He was kind of in his 50s, you know, the white silk scarf around his neck. And he said, yeah, he was a pilot for Avianca for many, many years, and he went into his own business with his bush flying into the Amazon. And he says, no, he says, I bring, he says, he says I know what it looks like, but I bring this plane into Miami every two years. It's inspected. I mean, unbelievable. Did you like the Amazon? It was, yeah, we liked it. It was very, very primitive. There was no electricity. Uh, the lights only went on a certain... The, the generator went on and you had lights like two hours. And they told you to bring plenty of flashlights because there, there was nothing there. I mean, your, your bathing was a faucet that came out of the wall and it was whatever your ambient room temperature, you know, whatever the room temperature that was. And you had all your kids with you? Yeah. yeah. We were there with another family was there, I think, a, a couple with... Five, with, with five, with five of us. There was, there was an Israeli who was single and another family. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember we got there, and we thought, you know, we're in the jungle. We want to walk through the jungle to see what a jungle looks like. Mm -hmm. And it happened to be on the Christmas day, 
And the guy there didn't want to take us out there. He said, uh, it's a holiday for him. So we, we said, we spent money to come here. We don't want to sit here. We, so he had to get up and then take us through a trip through the, through the jungle to see what it was like. Was a, we were on the Amazon River, so the most important thing in the jungle is your even rude motor. Because with your even rude motor, you can get anywhere. Without that, you get nowhere. There's no, no transportation, there's no roads. You gotta wait for a plane to come in. But with even rude, you can go up and down the river. So there was a, in the town, which was about a 10 minute walk, you know, you had the Amazon River, and um, they had a little area for uh, swimming across the other side of the river. You know, it was like a little beachy area. And for whatever, a couple of pesos, they took you across the river, you know, to, to go swimming. So the kids said they want to go swimming across the river. I said, fine. And um, they, never, they didn't come back. I said, where are the kids? What the hell happened to them? They never came back. So I go down to town to try to trace them. I go down by the river. You know, very few people do the Amazon. They don't speak English. I finally found somebody that spoke enough English to tell me, yeah, that he remembers they got on the boat, but the motor conked out on the boat and the boat drifted downstream. And the end of the story was the boat drifted downstream, the, the guy, you know, the motor died, and wherever it hit the shore, that's where he left the kids off, and they walked back to the jungles to come back. He's just, you know, just follow the, you know, just follow the river, back up. <laughs> and actually through the jungle, these kids walked back. Well, when they came out of the jungle, they were so dirty and so scratched up, uh, and the sweat was poor. I said, I don't believe it. You know, I said they could have been eaten by a tiger. No, no, don't worry, they're safe. He told me there's no wild animals in there. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, imagine that with your kids who dropped off downstream and had to walk back through the jungle to come yeah. back up to the, you know, the village again. And Nobody they, seemed to be the slightest bit concerned. The guy took us also to a place where the piranhas yeah. were. Yeah. The, the little fishes, only, only a fish maybe about uh, six, eight inches in length, and inches. with real sharp teeth. And they caught a few of them, and uh, the chef them, cooked, cooked it for us, and we had it for dinner. In other words, everything was a wood-burning stove. So the fish, the piranhas that we caught, they served. So you say, how do we know that they were our piranhas? Because one of them still had the hook in there, you know, the, the, that we fished with. The cook was a, uh, a good cook. I mean, I think he was leaving there to go to work for a hotel at the airport, I believe. It was a small guest house that we were in. Was about, and everything was open. There were no doors. You know, the only door is on your room, but the hallways are open, you know, there is no front door, there is no back door. Cinder block wall. Do you travel block. anymore now that your kids are grown? No. We, we were, we, the, the dining room, quote unquote, was just a covered area in back. Open, it was an open area, but they had a little, you know, tin roof over it, so at least if it rains, you're protected, with the wood burning uh, stove. And that's how the chef, you know, cooked your food. Everything was fresh, there was no refrigeration, there was no electricity. So everything you knew just came out of the field. And the cattle, you know, the, uh, the cattle used to walk right through while you were eating. They just walk right through this open area. <laughs> Not the, whatever the cattle with the long horns, what do they call them? Oxen. Was it a cow? Was it an oxen? Oxen. I mean, that's they okay. raised for their... Yeah. yeah. Well, it was Russia. Like, huh? Russia. It was 50 below zero. It was the, was I think we were there. It was the coldest day that they and said they had. It was 50 below. Years. Well, we got yeah. there. It was about 20 below zero. What month did you go? December. And the well, same thing. Crazy month to go yeah, well, and we, we said to our, again, our tour guide, they said, we were just curious. We said, uh, when do you close the school? She said, oh, we close it. Maybe it's 30 below zero. And every day it got colder and colder and colder. It hit 50 below zero. There's a point below zero. I think it's in the 40s, below zero, where Fahrenheit and centigrade are the same. You can calculate it out. Yeah. And it actually reached that point. And she said that we had a close school. It was the coldest winter. And I say, being in Leningrad and Moscow at this temperature, I said, now I realize why no European country has able to um, conquer Russia. Right. Because there isn't an, an army today that could withstand those kind of temperatures. But what were you doing? Like, what, what did you Sight do with yourselves? Thing. Oh, we, oh well, we were on a tour. We were on a tour. We were on a tour. Went out to the ballet, the theater every night. And the subway. They had the a subway. nice subway. We went to the Kremlin. We went to all those places. What, what year was that? Um, I think it was 77, maybe. Yeah. Wow. When the, we went to see that uh, Lenin's tomb, yeah. there's a big... Uh, a plaza before you get into yeah, the tomb. And there's a lot of people go to watch it. The the big, long, the it's a long line. So it was cold. So all the kids were, with Lori was a mask, all of them had the yeah, we mask up to their face. face. Yeah, we 
Well, it shows your they were heart. dancing to keep warm <laughs> before going into but the a mausoleum. Your nose froze. You, if you, you had to keep your camera in your coat. In other words, if you took your camera out for more than two minutes, the shutter froze. So you yeah. take it out, shot the picture, and put it right into your coat again. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine being at 50 below zero. We were prepared for it. I mean, I had the proper... Was that the first and last time you ever went to a country like that in the winter? That cold. And I said, yeah. never again. I said, I'm not doing that cold. I mean, but I yeah. researched it out. I went out... I mean, I knew it was cold. So, I mean, it's not that I didn't know it was cold. Right. I mean, it's, it's only light, like two hours later, got slightly light at 10, and by 1 it was dark again. But I researched. I had, you know, this fine woolen, uh, you know, uh, you know these, these uh, Down thermals. Coats. I had thermals. I had all kinds of, you know, you name it. It was a state of the art. We were prepared. So it's not that I wasn't prepared, but, you know, you put these clothes on, you can't move it like this. Yeah. But you know, when you think of Russia, you think of cold. And I think, and I think that was the best thing because if we went there, in the, if we went there in the summertime with the spring, whatever, it's not Russia. It's just like another country. But Russia, Siberia is cold, it was and it's cold. cold. And the hotels were fine. They had steam heat. In fact, we had to crack a window because our rooms were so hot. Did yeah. your kids look forward to these trips every year? Did they say, yeah. "Oh my God, yes. where are we going next?" No, they no. liked them. They, they they had a, they they do their own thing on these. Yeah. You know, the five of them together. Maybe one kid wouldn't. But I uh, I mean, I told you the airport. You know where Lori was was. One of the Russian guards there standing, and we're standing there making faces at him and everything. So that was the one that, no, that, that was in England. When in England at the, the, at the Windsor know, Castle. And I was saying, Lauren, get away from me. I'll take out a gun and shoot you. I mean, she's, you know, carrying one in front of him. He didn't even, yeah. you know, he wouldn't even blink. Sure enough, going out, we've met the same guard again. She starts again, you know, <laughs> oh, God. You know, they, they, wherever they went, they, they made a... Um, it was a comedy. Yeah. Whatever they did. At, at night time, uh, David would go around to the different corners and say, "Good night, Boris. Good night, Boris." To the light, to the lamp, just as if there was microphones there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, they, they, yeah. they just wherever they went, they raised. Um, you know, and, uh, we, I, I mean, Steve, Stephen's walking around Israel with a ra an Arab headdress. I said, "The soldier's going to shoot you." He wouldn't take it off. This rotten blonde, thirteen-year-old walking around with an Arab headdress. You know, it's, you know, he's being funny. That's that's what he, they do. They did all these cockamamie things. Um, it was just it was just not people. And Stephen, you know, that's when we adopted that. He's not that. that did you feel anything special about being in Israel compared to all these other countries you went yeah, to? Yeah, no, it was good. It was, it was you know the, the idea of history and here you're you're, you're on a, on a, an area that was you know it's five thousand years recorded history. You know, it was, it was yeah, the thing that impressed me the most, I mean, of the the language itself, the same language that was there. That many years ago so is still there at this time, and, and we, we saw it the, the writing on the on the stones about uh, the antiquity of the whole thing. Yeah. But um, even, so a lot of people go back a second time. We never went back we to a, back. a, a same place. Totally we never went back to a, a same place twice. Because well, there's only places to see. Right. Yeah. We haven't seen this country yet. <laughs> and the over. interesting thing is. Most people wait till their kids are grown before they travel. You did the opposite. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, when, when you travel with children, it's, it's a different adventure. I and mean, these were not babies. I mean, you know, they were... We I had no trouble with yeah, the we kids. Had no, it's just, None it, at all. It, it's just funny. I, I, in Paris, for instance, we, when we were in Paris, uh, we all wanted to do different things. So I said, okay, we'll separate. You know, I did things then. I don't believe I did them. Seriously, I look back. I said, nobody today would do what we did. So we all... Like what? Well, I'll tell you. Here are the kids... Terry was, um, I think, eight, which meant Robin was 12, Stephen was 13, Lori was 14, David was 15, all right? So we're in Paris, we all wanted to do different things. David wanted to go to the Louvre. I said, okay, go to the Louvre. Uh, Lori said she'll go with me shopping. And Terry ended up with Albert. Albert wanted to see the red light district. So uh -huh. he was, at eight years old, he slept to Rue de la, I forget what it is, Rue oh, de la Pet. Well, Rue de la Pet. Well, Frida stuck for, uh, <laughs> Terry on me. To, to protect I said, me. <laughs> I said, somebody's got to, you know, so, anyhow. So, Robin and uh, Stephen, they said they want to go out there. And I said, okay. I said, where are you going to go? They said, we'll go to the um, Champs-Élysées or, so, no, with the big shopping block. I forget what the, the main drag is. And they said, you know, they're going out themselves. Here, 12 and 13 year old, I let loose in Paris, all right? I said, you know, you can read the subway, you know how to read. It's very, subway system in Paris is crystal clear. You cannot get lost. You know, go on your own. They said, okay. So I went shopping with Lori, and here I'm walking down. Maybe it was Place de l'Opera. You know, it was a big shopping mall with department stores. So here, two hours later, I'm walking down Place de l'Opera with Lori, and who do I meet? 
Robin, uh, Robin and Stephen. I said, I don't believe it. Here I'm in a city of six million people. I can't even lose my own kids. I said, two hours later, it's like you're sending your kids into New York City. Wait a minute. And two hours later, you're meeting them on Fifth Avenue. That's about comparable. I said, I don't believe it. They went in one place. They were thrown out already. I forget what place it was. They, they tried them, no children, no children. You know, they were just going down. Could you believe it? I met my own kids. Yeah. Well, we were in India at the Kathmandu. <coughs> we yeah. checked in at a hotel, yeah, and she was, we met our neighbors there. Really? Yeah, they were just yeah. checking out so, here. I said, here I'm on the, on the top of, you know, the Himalayas, yeah. <laughs> and I meet one of my neighbors. Yeah. That was sort of funny. We had our experiences. Yeah. And we took a lot of pictures. I, I would bring back, I think, about, what, 30 rolls of film yeah, when yeah, came we came back. Minimum, you know, we, 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 and you know, uh, four or five hundred pictures. Or and unfortunately, I didn't put them in the albums and so just sling in, in, in paper bags someplace upstairs. Yeah, we, we have no idea sometimes you know, where they are, what it, island they were, what country it is. You know. We just have to figure out the year and what it was then. Yeah, Italy, we had a good time. We had a fun time in Italy. We were on a tour bus in Italy. I forget where it was going. And it turned into a side street. And if you know Italy, you know, some of these streets are tiny little streets. So here it turns into this street, this tiny little street. And there's cars parked on both sides, and the bus wouldn't make it through. It can't back up, and it can't go forward. Because there's cars on both sides, it's not going to make it down the middle. So the bus driver motions all the men out, so help me God. And what they did is they went down the whole row of cars on one side, lifted the cars, and put them up on the pavement. Remember that? Those small cars. They were all small cars, they were all tiny little cars. So here, maybe, you know. 20 men get out, and he just he told them what to do, pick up the car, and he put enough of the car, like half the car on the pavement, that the bus would get through. I said, oh, gosh. That's amazing. That's what they do in Italy. I mean, very, you know, very laid back about the whole thing. When we were in, um, in uh, England, in London, we went to see the Windsor Castle, and uh, there were big crowds going to see it. And when we left, we were all walking around, and suddenly we got a few blocks away, we found one person oh, was, yeah, missing. Lori was missing. Yeah. Terry was missing. No, it was, was Lori. Was it? I think, I think it was Terry. Terry. I think it was Terry. And then so suddenly we, we rushed back to that corner. There she's standing on a corner crying, <laughs> just standing in the corner, not moving. Well, I always <laughs> told them if you, if you separate, stay where you are and we'll find you. Yeah. Well, I, I did that on a, on a pickup once. I, I had to pick up the kids. I forget the, where they had to go, the dentist maybe or something. And I picked them all up at the um, <laughs> high school. And all the kids piled in, and I drove to the dentist. I guess the dentist is one kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I quick, I go back, and Terry was very young, and I quick run back to the high school, and there Terry is standing outside looking very confused. <laughs> you know, standing there in front of the door, still waiting. <laughs> You know, you know, all of a sudden you get to where you're going, you know she's missing a kid. <laughs> you know, because at the station wagon, they would just pile in. I didn't always count. Then we told them how to count off. So every time we went somewhere, they had to count off. Yeah, we get in the car and just said, so count off, so everybody go so one, three, two, three, four, four five. five. So I everybody was in the car. If we needed uh, her number, we knew somebody was missing. They always had encouraged Terry. She was yeah, a smarter than Two years old. Terry, what's your number? <laughs> After, during the, uh, when the kids were in school, Frida, of course, I don't know if you mentioned it, she became uh, uh, board, of uh, board of Education. She was elected to the Board of Education, to the... Uh, I ran, I ran for right, the office. Yeah. And uh, she ran the, twice, and she won. Yeah. And uh, she... Uh, I retired you know, with the, Terry. When my last kid graduated, we both went out together. I said, you know, that's the way it should be. You know, to let, let people be on the board of school. We have a picture of you giving her her, her yeah. diploma. So, so we both retired together, that was 84. So I was on for nine years. I, I ran three terms, a three-year term. And I said, that's it, I'm out. Yeah. And one of the guys who um, ran against me, was that Jerry Prejean or something? Yes, yeah. yes. I, he, he's, he's friends, we're friends. In fact, he went to Albert for his surgery, when he needed surgery. I said, Jerry, I said, you ran against me, you cost me $3,000, and then you go to my, my husband for surgery? I said, I'm charging you $3,000 for that surgery. <laughs> you know, he's laughing. I said, to make up for what it cost me to, to mount a campaign against you. 
And you had to go, go to Albert for surgery. I mean, that's fine games. Were these paid positions, this board of education? No, they're not paid, but they were very contested. They were very contentious in years. So you, you had a, when I say pay, you know, I put ads in the There's no salary for it. No, there's no salary. You know, it was a great honor. It was a, it was a prestigious position. But, you know, I, have, I printed flyers and ads in the paper and mailings. That cost money. You know, so and I still have a pile of cartons down there, leftover stuff. I'll show you. Come here, I have to share with you. Okay, I'm getting hungry. Yeah, Can I have some pot rolls before we continue? Yeah, I know. You're, you're, I have to show you one thing. Okay. I think I still have it. Albert, yes. did you want to say any final words? Yeah, that's right. I said everything. Uh, because Frida <laughs> came in here. Right, I'll, I'll just Frida hijack the uh, interview. Uh, okay, ask them what you want while I warm up everything. I don't know what else to, to finish up on. Uh, actually, actually, to say maybe that we've been living in this home now for since 1960, I believe, and uh, now we're planning on moving out of here and moving to uh, Philadelphia, but not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but near Philadelphia. Everybody, when they, we, I've, re, I've retired, and every place, where every person, when they retire, they end up in Florida or Arizona or whatever. We didn't like that kind of areas, and Frida is your, or a, originally a Philadelphian, and she liked to go back to Pennsylvania. I went to school in Philadelphia, so I don't mind that. I, I like the area, and so now we're moving out of New York, going to live in uh, near Doylestown, and uh, in Bucks County, and uh, kind of big home there, and uh, it's it's great. I'm looking forward to. It. I'm ready to move tomorrow. That's it. So you're going to pack up your 11 cars. How many cars are there now? We have, let's see, three, six, six seven. So no, six two, no, no, that's right, two, five, six. You're going to pack up your six cars and your motorcycle. Yeah, and your what van. we're planning on doing is probably both of us will drive down there together on two cars and leave one there and come back in one. And we'll do this a few times until we have more of the cars there. We have a three car garage there and a large parking lot. Part, so uh, it will be okay. Uh, that home has a lot of potential. It's going to be great. So this is like a rustic area. Yeah, it's, uh, well, the ho home is not rustic, but uh, it's not, uh, uh, we don't see any other people around us, and it's nice. The driveway has to be fixed. It's only a gravel driveway, and um, we're going to we'll have to pave that. Uh, but it's going to be, it's going to be nice. Be things to do there. Uh, I'll have, I think I'll have more interest in that house than I did in this house. Why is that? Well, I think because I was, when I was, lived here, I was busy and practicing. I didn't have much time. Uh, I'd go to work in the morning, come back at the, late in the afternoon or evening, and uh, didn't have much time for the house itself. Frida took care of all of that. That was, that was her strength. And it'll be the same thing over there, too. So what do you think you'll do when you're over there during the day? Uh, I'm going to, um, I'm not, I'm going to keep up my Pennsylvania medical license, but uh, I don't know if I'll be wanting, I don't, certainly don't want to go into practice again. I'll find out if there's something I can do in the hospital maybe, uh, what they have sometimes, doctors checking on charts, things like that, I might do that, or I'll go into something else, whether it's, um, there are a lot of doctors who've retired and uh, they do something else, whether it's selling cars or uh, opening up a, uh, a laundromat or whatever, but I, I'd have no problem doing something else. I, I don't think I have to stay in the medical field. I, uh, I'm interested, I keep up with it at the present time with the computer or with the magazines on the medical thing. Uh, this uh, September and October I'm going to uh, a surgical conventions. Uh, this may be one of the last ones I go to perhaps. But uh, it's, um, I keep up a little bit at the present time with uh, meeting with the surgical residents. I'm in charge of the surgical residency program at the Peninsula Hospital. So I meet with them every morning and we discuss the cases that came in during the night and discuss the cases that are in the hospital, uh, the complications, and uh, uh, I keep my fingers in it on that way. It's, uh, I have a lot of experience I can give to them, and uh, it, it, it keeps me interested for the, well, I'm not going to be off. I, I've had times people calling me now, they got my name from insurance companies, 
that they need an operation or need a consultation. And I'm very happy to say I'm retired and not doing it anymore. It doesn't bother me. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a, a dual interview. It's okay. It's a dual show. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Terry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Is this on? Yes. Yeah, okay. Some, uh, biographical data, real quick. Your uh, birthday? July 25th, 1966. Leo, born in New York City. <laughs> um, uh, I'm married now, coming up onto your anniversary. I'm not going to look right at the camera because that That's really fine. makes me uncomfortable, me. right? So, um, married two years this September. Got married, um, I think, the 7th. I think. So, I, I understand September you have a law degree. Yes, I do. So, like, what happened? Where are you now, and how did that happen? You think that's all so interesting? <laughs> She's like, yes, I think that's very interesting. Well, um, when I was in school, when I was in college, um, it's mom's fault. No, when I was, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I always loved shopping and fashion, but, you know, I didn't know anyone who ever made a career of it. No one. And at Penn, fashion was not a major. Um, and, uh, you know, I always did well in school. It was not really a big problem for me. And when I came home, I remember mom sat me down my junior year and said, you need to think about your future. How about medical school? She's like, we'll get you in. All you have to do is pass. I'm like, I've never taken biology. You were like, it doesn't matter. I got connections. I'll get you to NICOM. We'll set you up in a Durham residency. You'll be fine. And thinking back, you know, I probably should have done that, but I didn't. Um, is this getting it? All right, anyway. So I said, well, mom, I never took science. Not a great thing. She goes, how about law? And, you know, I was 20 years old. So I applied to some schools and uh, I got in. And, you know, I, it was, you know, I went. I, I guess I didn't really have a strong enough sense of what I really wanted to do or feel confident enough to really go after it. So I went to law school and, um, you know, I never went there thinking, oh, I definitely want to be a lawyer. I went there, I'll, you know, I'll do this. It wasn't uh, that much of a um, struggle, really. You know, it was fine. I mean, I've always been a good student. I actually actually graduated top 20% of my class. Um, worked in some big firms and everything, but wasn't in love with it. Um, when I graduated, I knew I didn't want to be in a firm. I liked the idea of being out and with people. So I went to the DA's office. And then within a year of working in the DA's office, I knew very quickly that I couldn't see a career path that I wanted to be. I couldn't find a woman who was like 40 years old and say, that's what I want to be doing or that's where I want to be. And I, I came home from work. I didn't want to talk about work. I had no interest about talking about work. I didn't want to hear about other people's legal problems. I didn't want to know about it. Didn't want to help anyone. Um, so I started thinking like, what did this mean? <laughs> like I knew I had to work my whole life, but what, what was I going to do? Because I couldn't see myself doing this for 20 years. So after about a year of working there, I started um, thinking really hard about what I wanted to do. Whether in law, I started in interviewing other legal jobs, um, researching other jobs. And I actually started taking a lot of those Meyer Briggs psychology tests and started reading some books, What Colors Your Parachute, and thinking about what is it that I love to do? What do I spend my spare time on? And um, what were some of my happiest work experiences? And some of that was in fashion when I worked in retail. So I then informationally interviewed a lot of people in the fashion industry and tried to figure out what, um, you know, what they did, whether I could fit into it. And it just got to a point, you know, after three years, I mean, that process took two years. I mean, it wasn't like one day I just woke up and said that was it. I mean, I really thought about it for a long time. I then one day just got to a point and I was, um, I think like 28 years old or 27 where I said, you know what? If I don't do this now when I'm single and have no responsibilities, I'm going to spend my whole life wondering whether I could have or whether what my life would have been like. And it became scarier for me to continue on the path I was and to make this change. And then I put like some time limits on myself, like, all right, by the end of you know 12 months from now, I'm going to be out of this. Um, and no one would hire me in the industry. No one would because they thought I was like a freak. Like, what is this? Um, so. After talking to enough people, I realized I had to do something drastic to let them know I was serious about it. 
So I quit my job, moved to New York, and enrolled in the Fashion Institute of Technology in a bunch of courses. And then, you know, within four weeks, I got a job basically volunteering um, at a designer showroom. But that led to a paying job, and that led to a better paying job, which led to a better paying job. But at least it showed people I was serious. So now I'm working for QVC, which is retailer in their um, Susan Graver collection, which is their largest proprietary brand, and it's moderate. And you know, I'm still not quite. I mean, uh, this this is going to make the family history. My career ends, which I don't think so. But I mean, I've been doing it now for three and a half years, and um, you know, I don't quite feel like I'm there yet and where I want to be. And late, I love retail, and I. You know, except that in a big corporation, everything's done by committee. And what I really want to go in here is for the creative aspect of it. And, you know, I can't always execute my own vision. And that's very frustrating to me. Um, so I think I'd really like to start my own business. I know it's such a ballsy thing because retail sucks these days, especially specialty retailers. But I just have to believe that, you know, there's always room for one more if you could do it well. Like what kind of business? Like a boutique, that type of a thing? Yeah. But of course, I of course would think it would become the next, you know, Fred Siegel's of Beverly Hills, <laughs> or Nan Duskett of Philadelphia. You know, I don't think small of anything. Right. But yeah. I don't know what those places are. What are they like? Rodeo fashion, places? yeah, fashion emporiums. Yeah. But they're, ve they're they're but they're specialty stores. They're one store. Right. I mean, I actually do a lot of merchandising for my friends. Like I help my friends go shopping. I edit their closets. I do that. So I don't get paid for it. I mean, that's what I really love. I mean. But this is a really good experience for me in terms of running a business from the financial aspect, forecasting it, planning it, and buying enough stock and doing the business end of it. So that's really been good too. And that, excuse me? I don't tell anyone how old I am, I, but I told you what my birthday is. I just turned 32, but I think I look young. And I know it's from the gene pool because you look very young. Right, don't I look young? Everyone thinks I'm 28, and that's the story I'm sticking with. 28. So. But Where do you get this fashion, this love of fashion? you think you got that from your mother, this love of fashion? Yeah. Yes, have you seen 200 feet of hanging space? I mean, <laughs> 200 feet of hanging space. It came from my mother. She subscribed to every fashion magazine known to mankind growing up. Growing up, there was Glamour, Bazaar, Vogue, Marabella's, Self, New Woman, Allure. Allure. I mean, she and subscribed. You, did you read them all? Of course I read them all. I, did I read them all growing up? Read them all growing up. W. W. Well, you didn't have that one growing up. I introduced you to that one. Growing up, she would uh, take me to the showroom sales in New York. I mean, you know, most, most kids don't shop showroom sales on 7th Avenue in New York, but she would. And take me. I always loved going there. Um, Were you the only kid that loved doing that? Um, I don't know, but here's a funny story. I remember when I was 13 and David came home from college and he had to buy shoes. Mom said to me, Terry, go with him and make sure he doesn't buy something stupid. Even at 13, she was having me pick out my older brother's shoes, who then was uh, 21, right? <laughs> Which is funny. Um, I remember like I helped Lori pick out a dress for Lisa LaBelle's wedding because she came in with something that was like, mom's like awful. She's like, Terry, go help her pick something out. Um, which is that silk blue number. Like I, I associate clothes. Like I remember like in key points of my life what I was wearing. Like, and what everyone else was wearing. Like I, I just always knew it. I think even with my doll collections, like growing up Barbie dolls, I would merchandise their outfits. Cause I remember I'd ask you for outfits. Like I, I need a new outfit for this doll, whatever. So yeah, I always kind of, don't you think I was pretty aware of it? Yeah. So it sounds like you're really on the right track where you want to be. I think so. Remember I used to pull old dad's old clothes when I was uh, in six, when I was um, 11, when the Annie Hall look, when I was 11, I would raid my father's closet and wear his suits, his vest, and his ties. And I'd come home and would be like, what are you wearing? You're wearing Howard's clothes. And be like, I know, but it's hip. <laughs> I don't think, did Gloria Robin do that? No. So I've always been pretty much into it. Am I in the right track? Actually, you know, the older I get, I think I could have done, I think I could do a lot of different things. You know, I don't think there's just like one, I mean, sometimes maybe there is, but I really love this. But, you know, after, after I get tired of this in 10 years, I think I'd probably like to do something else maybe. 
You know, I think there's a lot of things that people can do. I mean, I like definitely having the knowledge of law. I think it makes me, it's very empowering to know how things work and know what you can get away with and what anyone else can. I mean, that's a very empowering feeling. I mean, it's nice to know, you know, when, like when buying my house, when dealing with real estate agents and mortgage brokers to, it gives you confidence to know that there's nothing you can't learn or accomplish. So. You've got a lot of confidence. Do you find that out of most of the people you know that you've got more confidence than the average person? Well, not from my girlfriends from college because as I get older and I realize other people, um, compared to my girlfriends in college, I'm pretty much of a wimp. I mean, my two best friends already have their own business, quite frankly. I'm really like behind. Like one of them has their own consulting business and does very well. Another one has their own florist business. A lot of the guy friends I went to school with are out on their own. So from, but that's like a very select, like from Penn, I mean, that's, you know, it's kind of a select group. But Where's now that, college? Sorry. University of Pennsylvania. So from that peer group, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm so average, it's ridiculous. Um, but compared to the world of retail, which, you know, let's face it, you don't exactly need a college degree to be in it to begin with, probably. So, you were the youngest of your siblings. Right. Was that a good place to be? Well, obviously I can't speak to what it would be like somewhere else, but, um, you know, it has, it has its advantages and disadvantages. What were the advantages? Um, I think with my parents, you know, by the time I was going through school, you know, they had already done it. They were much uh, less removed from it. I mean, much more removed from it. Yeah, right. Sorry. Yeah. Much more removed yeah. from it. Right. Which, you know, at the time I didn't like, but actually in retrospect, looking at the effects, it was a good thing, I think. <laughs> they could back, you know, looking back, they could have been a little bit more removed. <laughs> a little less influence, please. No, but when I th and then when if I think about how it was, must have been compared to David and Lori. It was, oh, yeah, I can Remember only imagine. I tell you all the time. What? I don't know how no, good I have it. No, that we've already made all the mistakes that we make. We can't yeah. make it anymore. Right. 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 And so that was fun. And the other fun thing for me was, well, because I was like so left alone. I think it was uh, you can do my own thing a little bit more in high school. Like I didn't. Well, your mom was never there. Right. So that must have been fun. fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. I can't lie. I went out a lot. I was very social. I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends in high school. I don't. Well, you worked Friday night too and Sunday night. I don't know. I just remember. I look back on high school. I had a lot of friends. You know, with the Eigens and like my friends. I don't. I mean, do you remember me sitting home much in high school? She's like, she, of course she has no recollection of anything, like Terry, Robin, whoever, you know, it doesn't matter. But uh, I had a blast. Um, did you have, how many marriage proposals did you have before Bill? Um, I don't know, should I count Jeffrey, like in junior year? Jeffrey, not none real, I mean, nothing serious. You know, I didn't, you know, I like broke up, you know. I was like, if this isn't going, I'll break up, whatever. But, um, so how's it being married? I like it. I like it a lot. What do you like about it? Um, well, I think for me, I married someone who, uh, you know, is not a tight ass, doesn't like, none of this like, I don't think I could have married a more supportive person. You know, whatever I want, it's like, fine. He just wants me to be happy. There's no, where is dinner? You know, how come th there's no milk? It's like, Oh, there's no milk. You stay here and watch TV. I'll get it. <laughs> you know, uh, there's none of that stuff. Um, you know, it's only how can I better support you? Wow, sounds like you married the right guy. <laughs> no, but he's very, he's very. Um, I mean, it goes both ways. But there's none of that uh, like macho garbage that I think. I think men have to a certain degree growing up in this culture. I think it's rare that they don't. But I don't really see much of it with Bill. I mean, well, he hangs out with his family a lot. I mean, that's his macho garbage, but it doesn't come, it doesn't come with me.
you know, he has a lot of gay friends. He's, he's very much in touch with his feminine side. No, I mean, I think that has a, that helps in a certain sense, you know. He thinks it's funny if people think he's gay, you know. He's very open. He's, oh my God, this has got to be edited out with that part. <laughs> you have to edit that part out. But <laughs> If I can hear any of this, I'm hoping okay. I'll be able to hear it. Oh, wait a second. Uh, We're, oh, is this still here? Okay. Um, kids. You want kids? Yeah, I have the equipment. Might as well see if it works. <laughs> How many do you want? No, I do want kids. Um, I do want kids. Uh, I think we want two, and um, I, you know, ideally I'd love to get my, you see this is all up in the air, but ideally I'd love to get a business running back and, you know, up and running first because I want to be accountable for my own time. And when you work for a corporation, it's difficult to do that. You know, you're expected to be there between, you know, 8.30 and 9 every day. I mean, that's what you're expected to be in working America unless you have flexible hours. And most corporations don't, not really. Um, so I keep thinking, you know, if I can have my own business and I'm the boss and I get it reasonably successful, then I can have a kid go do what I need to do in the afternoon for a couple of hours and, you know, they'd be back there. So I'd like to, I don't know, maybe in, I don't know, two, three years or something. I mean, my mother was, I mean, even though she worked at night, I mean, she was there to do what you need to do in the afternoon. So, because I don't know how you get people to do that for you when you're, um, when you're working in a corporation, like, you know? I don't know how people do that. I mean, what they do is they just have a babysitter for like eight hours and that's it. So, do, are you and your mother close? Yeah. I mean, a lot. Do you go shopping together? Yeah. Yeah, go shopping together. So, do you have any stories you want to tell? Family trips, uh, growing up, funny stories about growing up. Uh, I heard all about your family trips. Which ones? All of them. Like, right. Did you enjoy those trips overseas? Um, you know, I was young and, you know, like my perspective of what I was doing there was very different like than an adult. So, you know, I remember, you know, not being able to go out and my siblings were and I had to stay back at the hotel. <laughs> see, the trips I took alone with Laurie, you see, as I got older, I liked it a lot. I mean, when I was young, going to Israel, Europe, hard to remember, but as I got into high school um, and I started taking them, I actually did like them and, and maybe not even so much, you know, because it was like a nice time to be with the family, you know, siblings. I remember like, you know, sharing a room with Robin and Lori at the same time, which was, I think that was in China, you know, sharing a room with them, which, you know, was, was unusual. That was fun. Um, and, uh, what trip with Bubby? That was like in Israel. No, it was in Korea. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, when I was... Right. Right. When I was 15, I went to Paradise Island. And uh, I couldn't find a girlfriend to go with me. And my mother didn't want me to go alone. So she sent me with Bubby. But of course she broke her wrist, like the day before she left. And I don't know how old she was, like 70 something? So she had this cast on her wrist. I'm 15. And, um... You know, it was really actually a lot of fun. Like she, like she wasn't clingy. She did her own thing. I don't really think she did much, but she certainly didn't. Um, she didn't make me feel bad for going out to the beach or meeting people. And I met a lot of people there, which actually I'm thinking, boy, you know, I was young. I was meeting people. I don't know if I would do that now in a club med, but um, she, when we ate together at the dining room, because you know she had this wrist, she was constantly breaking glasses all during the meals, constantly, constantly knocking over water glasses and having them shatter. I mean, it was ridiculous. One meal, I think she broke like three. I mean, like the busboy was there, like constantly cleaning up after us. That didn't really bother us. It was kind of fun. So, and then Lori and I traveled a lot together. We went to um, Mexico together. Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro together. Um, what happened was, as my siblings got older, they couldn't travel as much. So um, the two of us went to India together with my parents, which was a lot of fun. And uh, we went together 
with my parents to um, on safari in Kenya, which was a lot of fun. And um, those trips were great. I mean, as I we, I went the two of us went alone to Rio de Janeiro. Is that wild? How old were you? Oh, then I was in college. I was uh, I was 19, and she was um, I was 19 or 18, and she must have been um, 24. And uh, we went to some clubs, went to discos there, and. Um, I remember she couldn't find me when it came time to leave and these were like huge clubs in Rio like where people were packed and I started dancing on a speaker but well, there were other people dancing on speakers too it wasn't like I started this trend but I managed to get myself up on a speaker above the crowds and Lori was like I can't find my sister I mean it was like I'm telling you 500 people were packed on this dance floor and all of a sudden she's like well that oh my god that's Terry dancing on that speaker over there and I was kind of dancing but like looking you know I wanted to make myself visible to her so she could find me because you know we, and I don't even know what we we're thinking about splitting up that way but you know we went there someone asked her to dance someone asked me to dance and what can I tell you we were just like whatever so we did that which was a lot of fun and she actually bought a um a thong bikini while we were there but uh, she refused to wear it on the beach. That she'd only wear it in the hotel room. <laughs> we were right across the beach. And this is before thongs were really big in the United States. I was like, wear it on the beach. But she did. And then um, when we went to Mexico, this is like kind of a nutty Lori story that um, we stayed at this Jappy resort in Acapulco. And, um, you know, she'd want to get up at 7 in the morning to throw our beach towels down on the beach chair to reserve our beach chair down by the pool. Now, I'm thinking, this is my college break. I just want to sleep in. She had these days, like, reg I think that was our last person trip together. I think we came back, I complained to you. Um, so I was like, Lori, I just, I just want to relax. No, we need to get the chase lounge by the pool because it was so choppy. These people were there reserving chairs before breakfast. It was quite the competitive thing going on. So that was uh, Mexico. But that was kind of fun. So it sounds like you've lived a very exciting life. Well, yeah, as I get older, I appreciate it more. Yeah. Oh, that's not... Uh, that's so interesting. Okay, well, when I was um, 16... Okay, yeah, 16, All right. All right, keep going. Okay, so... Not that it seemed, but when I was 16, I went to Europe on this hiking, biking, and uh, sightseeing tour throughout um, France, England, and the Netherlands. And uh, my best friend on the trip, after a week into the trip, you know, well, they, it was like 15 teenagers and their kids from all over the country. Well, there was one other girl from Manhattan. So who do you think I become friends with? Not the girl from like Idaho, the girl from Manhattan is who I hit it off with, you know, another little Japola. And we hit it off like from the first day. Well, by day seven, it turns out that this Japola, her name was Marcy Klein, but I didn't know what that meant. Her father's Calvin Klein. Oh, <laughs> that's a great story. You right. the end of it, after, after the summer. You know, uh, what, where I went to a party? She had her sweet oh, right, right. So we became, so we were already best friends.